it is well established that resistance training is highly effective for maximizing muscle growth and strength adaptations. To achieve these goals, individuals should carefully consider various factors such as training volume, frequency, and other key variables. In addition, nutrition plays a crucial role in supporting these adaptations. Specifically, paying attention to dietary protein intake is essential, including total daily intake, distribution of protein across meals, and the timing of protein intake relative to resistance training sessions both before and after workouts. Research indicates that higher total daily protein intakes are more effective for increasing muscle mass compared to lower intakes, with an optimal threshold of around 1.6 grams of protein per kilogram of body weight. Now, I personally prefer to calculate protein requirements based on lean body mass, as this approach provides a more accurate estimate and helps avoid overestimations in individuals with higher body fat percentages. Consuming protein beyond this threshold is unlikely to provide additional benefits for muscle building, and not to mention it can lead to an unhealthy relationship with food. Additionally, the timing and distribution of protein intake throughout the day are important for individuals who regularly engage in resistance training. Evidence suggests that evenly distributing protein across multiple meals enhances post-feeding muscle protein synthesis, which is basically the process of building new muscle proteins and supports muscle growth. However, some studies have shown no significant effect of meal timing or protein distribution on muscle growth. So given the conflicting findings in existing research, a recent study by Lark et al. aimed to address some of the limitations of previous studies and contribute to the broader understanding of this topic. The researchers investigated the effects of two different protein timing strategies on muscle growth and strength outcomes. So let's take a look at this study design. So in this study, the researchers randomized 31 resistance trained males with at least three training sessions per week for a minimum of one year, averaging about three years of experience into one of two groups. The first group, protein was consumed immediately before and after the training sessions. In the second group, the participants were asked to consume protein around three hours before and three hours after each training session. All participants were instructed to consume approximately two grams of protein per kilogram of body weight every day, with the only difference being the timing of the protein relative to the resistance training sessions. Each group consumed 25 grams of protein in the meal prior to training and another 25 grams in the meal following the training session. The remaining protein needed to reach the 2 gram per kilogram daily threshold, which was recommended to be distributed evenly throughout the day across 4 to 7 meals with 20 to 40 grams of protein per meal. Now, carbohydrate and fat intakes were advised to fall within the acceptable macronutrient distribution ranges, and these are 45 to 65 and 20 to 35 percent of total energy intake for carb and fats respectively. The participants also kept a daily food record using mobile applications like MyFitnessPal and other similar apps. The resistance training protocol in this study was individualized based on the participants' self-reported volume from baseline data. Participants with a volume of fewer than 20 sets per week followed a four-day training regimen, while those with more than 20 sets per week followed a five-day training program. The four-day program included sessions targeting both the upper and lower body, they were two sessions each, whereas the five-day program added an extra upper body session, so three days of the upper body and two days of the lower body. The training adhered to what's known as a non-linear periodization model, with the repetition ranges predominantly between 8 to 15 per exercise and maintaining a reps in reserve of around 1 to 2. The periodized resistance training program was adapted from previous literature and was conducted under the supervision of a certified strength and conditioning specialist. Now, if the participants missed a scheduled training session, then a makeup session was arranged within a week. Both groups followed the training protocol for around eight weeks. Now, the study utilized the in-body bioelectrical impedance equipment to assess various body composition parameters, including skeletal muscle mass, fat mass, and body mass index. Maximal strength was measured using the one rep maximum test for both the leg press and chest press exercises. And these measurements were taken around 72 hours before and after the eight week intervention. So let's take a look at the findings. After the eight week intervention, both groups showed significant increases in skeletal muscle mass with the immediate group gaining around 1.18 kilograms and the three hour group gaining around 1.07 kilograms there were no significant differences between these groups. Other body composition metrics such as fat mass and body max index both remained unchanged. Now let's take a look at the strength adaptations. 
So following the eight-week intervention, both groups demonstrated significant improvements in muscle strength. The immediate group increased their leg press strength by around 25.6 kilograms, and the chest press strength was 12.33 kilograms, while in the three-hour group, they showed gains of around 44 kilograms in the leg press and then 9.73 kilograms in the chest press. And there were no significant differences observed between these groups. So what are our takeaways from this paper? Well, the findings of this study suggest that regardless of protein timing, providing adequate protein supplementation leads to significant improvements in muscle mass and strength in trained individuals. So this indicates that the exact timing of protein intake relative to resistance training sessions is actually less critical than the overall total daily protein intake when it comes to maximizing training adaptations. However, there are some limitations to consider. The study did not detail the specific exercises performed in the training program, which limits our ability to assess the overall effectiveness of the training regimen. Additionally, changes in skeletal muscle mass were measured using an in-body equipment, which, while very practical, may not capture site-specific changes in muscle across the different body regions, such as the limb or the trunk. Overall, this study contributes to the growing body of evidence that indicates that total daily protein intake is a key factor, if not the most crucial dietary variable for maximizing training adaptations. As long as you achieve a sufficient total daily protein intake, you are likely meeting the demands of your training program. But it's important to note that these findings are based on neutral caloric diets, meaning they do not account for extreme weight loss or weight gain.